Hi, I'm Daryl Cagle, and this is the Cagle Cast, where we're all about political cartoons. And today we have three great cartoonists to talk about their favorite Trump cartoons. Our first cartoonist is Steve Sack, who has been the Hello. brilliant cartoonist for the Minneapolis Star Tribune for close to 40 years. More than 40 years. More than 40 years. Steve has won the Pulitzer Prize and just about every award an editorial cartoonist can win. And he has been the standout cartoonist in our Cable Cartoons Syndicate for many years until he recently retired, which I am still crying about. Thanks for being here, Steve. Happy to be here. And this is one of Steve's lovely cartoons with Trump and the big lie and kicking Liz Cheney out of the nest of little hungry birds. I have to describe all these cartoons because this is also an audio podcast. So this is a wonderful cartoon, Steve. I like to make critters. Your critters are so cute and your cartoons are so biting and harsh. The cuteness just makes them go down like a sugar-coated pill. And here you have all of the butt-kissing elephants kissing the, the big lie Trump butt, and they said there is no bottom. This is hilarious. This is one of those extra cute, extra nasty cartoons. And it, it's a cartoon that you could run just about any day of the year. Our next cartoonist is Pat Bagley. Pat has been the brilliant cartoonist for the Salt Lake Tribune in Utah since 1979, and he has won a ton of awards, including the Herblock Award, and he is also a shining star in our profession. Good to be here. This is a wonderful one with uh, Trump climbing out of the sewer and tracking all the muck over the presidential seal. It's just a beautiful cartoon, a beautiful composition. So I did that probably a month or two after he got into office. That is just a, a great cartoon. Here you have him stoking the fires of hatred and a uh, giant furnace, shoveling in the hate. I think that's great. Giant mega furnace, yeah. Okay, this is uh, Steve Sachs' version of Cal. Steve also does sculptures. And Cal, it's a great pleasure to have you with us today. <laughs> well, uh, Too much hair. Oh, dear. This is one of yours, Cal. This is uh, Trump. Godzilla. Is that Cassidy Hutchinson? It is. It is. Cal is the pen name for Kevin Callagher, who has also won tons of awards. Cal has drawn for many decades for the Baltimore Sun and the Economist magazine in London, where he has drawn and painted over 150 of their magazine covers. Cal's cartoons appear everywhere. And Cal is the first cartoonist outside of our syndication group that I've invited to appear on our podcast because I'm a Cal fan. So <laughs> thank you for coming. Oh, it's so, so nice to have you. Here's another one of your cartoons that I thought was great. Trump jumping off the high dive and doing a, a belly flop into the pole pool. But Fox likes him and the other stations don't. He gets a 10 from Fox. That's funny. That's a beautiful Thank drawing. Thank you. So you, you, <laughs> okay. captured, you captured the Fox news host perfectly. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to go through a bunch of Steve Sack cartoons. And mm -hmm. I call these favorite Trump cartoons because they're my favorite Trump cartoons. I picked your cartoons, Steve. And this yeah. is a big Trump nuclear mushroom cloud blowing yeah, well, up that, the status that, that one quo. Was, that one was not my favorite. That was one of three cartoons I drew for election day when we didn't know it was so close. We didn't know who was going to be the winner. So I had a really nice cartoon for Hillary winning. Yeah. And uh, then I had this cartoon in case the, the worst happened. And I had another cartoon in case we didn't know. And I, the paper ran the cartoon with the unknown cartoon in it. And it wasn't until the next morning, in the middle of the morning, that they substituted it with this one. And of the three, this I thought was the poorest quality, probably because I couldn't stand the idea of that guy winning. <laughs> well, I liked it. This one made me laugh out loud. This is just hilarious. You've got the presidential seal. It says the seal of this president. And there's Lindsey Graham as a seal honking, yes, boss, yes, boss, yes, boss. That's just hilarious. Well, thank you. There's there's a million cartoons about, you know, using the presidential seal. And it's uh -huh. always a challenge to find a new way of doing it. Here you've got the, the Kremlin hacking department, and it is uh, Onion Dome top Donald Trump in the Kremlin. I think that's wonderful. That's fantastic. That's beautiful. And Trump in a lava lamp, shape-shifting positions, free-floating conspiracies, oozing racism, fact-twisted into slippery blobs of incoherent goo and oddly mesmerizing. I think that's wonderful. Yeah, that was during the presidential campaign when he was first running. And I really couldn't believe that he was gaining support. You know, the guy has been vile from day one, 
and he just gets worse and worse. And <laughs> yet those folks back him and they keep supporting him. It just drives me crazy. I will never understand anybody who supports Trump. I just, I just absolutely don't get it. <laughs> well, I got to say that I agree with those guys. But that best lava lamp I've seen. I can't recall any other lava lamp cartoon. <laughs> did you do a lava lamp cartoon, Cal? I think I did, but my editor said this is not a lava lamp, so I had to redo it again. And I can't remember what it was about, but I have done a lava lamp. Well, here's Trump in America. America is his locker room for his locker room talk, and he's towel snapping Uncle Sam with his vulgarity. I think this is great. Now that, that one was drawn when the Access Hollywood tape came out, and huh? the big excuse he made was it was just locker room talk. That's what inspired this. So this is Mara Lego, and he is such a sad little victim, even when he's playing with all his Legos. Yeah, I always like to do things with toys and animals and things like that. I like to make uh, images, that are, images that are fun to look at. Well, this is fun. I also like the movie parodies. I've noticed in looking at the stats, movie parody cartoons almost always uh, outperform everything else. They they float up to number one. Readers and editors, well, I, we only track what editors like. Editors just love the movie parody cartoons well we all we all, we all did a barbie Oppenheimer. we all did Bar barbenheimer didn't we i think i did by the way both are great movies <laughs> here's a star wars one also star wars they just eat up every star wars metaphor and there's a couple of guys out there that buy the originals of the star wars cartoons i get a call when star wars cartoons are oh, boy i think we're all working on ipads and it's all digital right yeah so the, so the originals really are just ones and zeros it yeah, is i sell uh, mine a nickel a pixel <laughs> <laughs> do i miss the originals yeah i mean that's a lot to lose well, I mean, the thing is, you can go back and you can correct things. And it, uh, the reason we all do it is because it's better. It's just better. The okay. first time I tried drawing digitally, I instantly switched. And I, I never did an original cartoon again. Mm -hmm. When you look at Steve Sack's works, you completely understand why digital painting is such a good way to go. He uses new textures and special effects that make them come alive. And I just love looking at each one of them. Well, oh, gosh. this oh. is wonderful. <laughs> Here's a Star Trek one, Operation Warp Reality. Our lifelong mission to explore strange new loopholes, to seek out new deductions and avoidance opportunities, to boldly dodge taxes like no one has dodged before. This is the Trump form. 1040. This is hilarious. Trump and his kids. It's when his taxes were leaked. He didn't pay taxes for, what, a decade? I also noticed Star, uh, Star Trek cartoons are like the wildly popular ones, too. And these movie cartoons are just crazy popular. Mm -hmm. Here's Tangled and Trump combing his hair of lies <laughs> that are tying up Pompeo and Esper and the Republicans. This is great. I don't remember, remember doing that many movie and TV cartoons. Here you got the QAnon shaman. He's in jail. <laughs> And the guard says, ever think about what it was that landed you here in the first place? And it's Trump's image as he's crossing out all the days in jail. This is fun. Yeah, we're lucky that he has such a strong profile. Steve is great at showing Trump in all its different machinations. Trump has so many cartoony elements, you can get away with just one of those little elements and it can define all of them. All you need is a tie or a little wisp of yellow hair and uh, those little his... puffer fish lips yes you could draw him just with the puffer fish lips who votes for this guy who puts on bronzer every day and his hair is just bizarre it's just absolutely bizarre and he's just so ugly his followers think that he's charlton heston moses character i don't get it i don't understand it here steve has the uh, trump stomping the sour grapes into wine and the drunk republican drinking it it's fascinating to me that trump's personality is so focused on being a victim yeah. because i wouldn't think that most people think of victims as somebody that they're particularly eager to vote for i mean we we have sympathy for victims but you don't have sympathy for trump the victim yet they want to vote for him i think that's crazy there's kind of this attitude among the fox viewers that they see themselves as victims and they just rel revel in that victim oh they love that i i'm being indicted for you that whole thing i'm a victim <laughs> So what's, what's up with that? I do see a lot of victim angles in editorial cartoons, and it just seems like victimhood is what defines the whole Trumpness. Oh, true. And the thing, 
is that he, this billionaire who supposedly is richer than anybody on earth is shilling for dollars from these people who are on social security and welfare and they're giving him money. Again, I just don't understand the whole mentality. Give him money plastic. like you would give money to a charity for victims. Yeah. It's a plastic ploy of populism. But what's different now is, is that with social media and television, and he being a kind of a television star, he can amplify it in a way that's never been seen before. Exactly. Another thing that editorial cartoonists like to do a lot is statues of Lincoln. And here you've got the Lincoln statue being hammered out into a Trump statue, the party formerly known as Lincoln. This is great. I love these Lincoln statue cartoons. I hate Lincoln statue cartoons. <laughs> ah! <laughs> So here's the thing. I think this is why why Steve did this cartoon is because Trump is always comparing himself to all these historical figures. And in his view, and in the view of a lot of his followers, he's the best president ever, or maybe the best president since George Washington, or maybe the best president since Abraham Lincoln. It just depends on how he's feeling that day. Again, where do these people get their education? Where do they learn this stuff? Okay, well, here you got Mount Rushmore. Three, three of them are, are wearing sacks over their heads, and one of them's wearing a Groucho mask to obscure their identity so that they're not associated with the Trump statue on the end. That's very funny. This this is kind of a throwaway cartoon for Steve Sack, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember what triggered this. I think there were people talking about how he should be on Mount Rushmore. Yeah. And there were actually small statues that people could buy showing Mount Rushmore with him on it. I think that this was just my reaction to that. Here he is uh, conducting the Symphony of American Carnage as everything crashes around him. Well, that was the, that was my January 6th cartoon when all of that was happening and, and we had to comment on it. It was, it was one of these tragedies that happened that we all have to do a cartoon on and you got to find a way of, of expressing it, of how you feel about it. And this is how I saw it. That's great. You know, Daryl, you said that we should be arguing and it's so hard to argue when you look at these cartoons. They're, short, they're all beautiful. They're well executed. They're funny, funnier than my cartoons. They're very funny. Of course, I agree with them. Not everybody will, but we agree with them. They're true. This is factual. This is yeah. what's happening. Yeah. Well, you don't have to argue. You could just shower each other with compliments. Okay. I was going to say that they have to shower me with the same amount of compliments I shower upon them. That's a part of the deal, right? I will edit everything so that you get equal compliments. Okay. So here we've got uh, Trump as the Terminator, another movie cartoon. He says, I'll be back. That's hilarious. Well, this cartoon was done right after... Um... Biden was certified. And if you remember, a lot of Republicans were turning against Trump at first. You know, look at Lindsey Graham. He said, I'm done. I'm done with this guy. And a lot of Republican leaders were ready to move on. And I did this cartoon because I didn't believe that Trump was gone. And um, he sure enough came roaring back. No, no, no. You got it exa exactly right. One of my bosses came to me after I was doing an anti-Trump cartoon after he had lost. He goes, he's so done, he's just done. And this guy's a Republican, so he's just not gonna be back, he's, he's over. And I'm thinking, do I tell this guy he's my boss? Do I tell him he's wrong? <laughs> you just let it go. Okay, I wanna see more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's uh, Donald J. Trump presidential papers. And of course it's toilet paper, <laughs> stuffing up the toilet and the pipes in the <laughs> National Archives Museum. The lady says, that explains his weird obsession with flushing toilets 15 times. <laughs> you know, when he was complaining about the low flow toilets and how you have to flush them 15 times, we got so many toilet cartoons. It was just a flood of toilet cartoons. <laughs> And they were all good. I mean, cartoonists love toilet cartoons. Well, we do. That's true. And how did the editors respond to them? I don't remember tracking toilet cartoons. Editors don't like bodily fluids, but you've got toilets without <laughs> bodily fluids. I'm not big on drawing bodily fluids. Boy, we get so many bodily fluids, and especially blood. When there's war illusions, the bloody hands, the blood on I this and that. I do blood. I do blood. I do blood, but... Other oozings I, I prefer to avoid. Editors don't like to print blood. Blood in a cartoon kills the cartoon. It's like having uh, Hitler or a Ku Klux Klan hood. No matter how well-deserved that is in the cartoon, they just don't want it. But I don't notice them avoiding toilets unless there's bodily fluids. This is a wonderful cartoon. Trump University, he's at the cheat and grab the junk machine, and the machine is uh, grabbing his wallet. Oh, my God. That's, a, that's wonderful. I love it. It <laughs> is superb. But the, the texture of the, you know, the hand, which is, you know, the 
device that's normally inside of these machines. It has all the grippy fingers that you know feel so so feel familiar. Yeah, that's picking the pocket. It is magnificent. That is magnificent, Steve. Well, thank you. I love those machines. Like <laughs> you, said, have I you like, ever? I like to do toys. Have you ever won anything in one of those machines? Are you kidding? I don't think anybody has. Okay, we're switching to Pat. Here's the end of an era. Show us your dinosaur shirt. Oh. Okay. By the way, dinosaurs are wonderful for editorial cartoonists. True. Do you see the eyeglasses in the dinosaur? Yeah. Okay, so this was done by Riley Black, who is a paleontologist out here living in Utah. And Utah is, a, is heaven for paleontologists because there are bones everywhere. And so I love dinosaurs too. And here are the Republicans in their natural habitat where they're picking money and they're giving each other money. And money is the root of all Republicans. And here they are. And Trump is screaming down as this giant asteroid that's going to destroy the whole ecosystem, I hope. That cartoon oh. was overly hopeful. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so here you have Trump with his Sharpie marker, and his Sharpie marker is so funny. But you can almost draw Trump just by drawing a Sharpie marker. And he's here crossing out we the people on the Constitution with me. That's wonderful. Well, he was just caught this last week in one of his many court cases, arguing that he didn't have to defend and protect the Constitution. He didn't have to uphold it. His, his lawyers were making some weird legal argument that he wasn't Legal, uh, legally obligated to defend the Constitution. I'm saying this and you're thinking, oh no, he's just repeating stuff he hears on the internet. Look it up, look it up. Mm. His lawyers are arguing before one of these court cases that he doesn't have to defend the Constitution. He's That's sworn it. to defend the Constitution. Oh, he's sworn to do a lot of stuff, but does he do it? He <laughs> tells the truth. Does he ever tell the truth? No, he's so slippery. But you know, that's one of the things that conservatives say all the time. Look it up. Check it for yourself. Oh, yeah. Research. Okay. This is so, I... Sometimes you sound conservative, Pat. So here you've got fairy Trump flying over his boxes of top secret documents saying, you are declassified and you are declassified and you are declassified and you are declassified. The declassification fairy. That's very funny. The thing is, the rules don't apply to him. And well, well, his mm -hmm. uh, his declassifications are just as real as fairies are. Exactly. Okay. He said he can declassify documents just in his mind. Okay, which is he's he's an absolute lunatic, which is fine. We have lots of lunatics, but he's got the Republican Party in his pocket, who believe pretty much everything he said. You got two thirds of Republicans thinking that the republic that the uh, election was stolen in 2020, and it's a lie. You get an entire political party believing a lie, an absolute provable lie. This is dangerous times. This is bad. I don't know. What, what do you what do you do as a cartoonist to expose just how bad it is? We do our best. We try. Well, it is important, of course, that all of these cartoons are just little tiny specks of sand and a whole sandstorm, you know, that you have to keep on doing it. Do your little bit. Keep on going. Don't get discouraged because our voices are, are important and they help in the whole conversation. OK, and it's also good to be on the record. When people look back on this, they go, oh, how come people, did, people didn't realize this? They go, well, people did. Some people understood what was going on at the time. So we're establishing a record of what happens. That's part of what we do. This is wonderful. It's the maggot dog drinking out of the Fox News toilet. This is like an icon for our times. This is one of those that's not going to be misunderstood. I think it's pretty clear. What I'm to do. <laughs> that's a and perfect you cartoon. Can draw, you can draw a bright line between the establishment of Fox News in 1996 and the erosion of trust in the institutions that make us a nation. They started saying, we're the truth, don't believe anybody else. And they started going after everybody. And it's since 1996, started happening a little bit before with Rush Limbaugh, but since 1996 and the introduction of Fox News and right-wing media, the country's just gone downhill. Not because of Republicans or Democrats, it's because of right-wing media, because they just lie. They just lie all the time. I, I do notice that editors are reluctant to print cartoons about Fox News. Of course, most of the cartoonists are liberal and they love to draw cartoons about Fox News. And there's a whole lot of them that just don't get printed. And that's very frustrating, I think. But in general, newspapers, journalists are fascinated by any kind of reporting about journalism. And they, they play that up. But they don't print stuff that's critis critical of other news outlets. And I find that disappointing. Well, Daryl, are they also reluctant to print cartoons about mainstream media, MSM? 
You see a lot of those by the conservative cartoonists. You do. And, you know, back in the day, everybody used to think that since there are so many conservative-leaning papers, because most papers are small and rural or suburban and tend to have more conservative audience, and fewer papers are big and have a urban liberal audience, we used to think that the fewer conservative cartoonists got reprinted more than the liberal cartoonists. And in recent years, that is no longer true. What happens is all of the editors reprint the same cartoons, which are cartoons that express no opinion at all and that are just funny little gags. So the conservative and the liberal papers print the same cartoons. So it's just very frustrating for us cartoonists in this environment as, as newspapers grow more timid over time as their elderly audience shrinks and their circulation declines. Well, I've wondered about that too, because we're controversial, but we're supposed to be controversial. And we've always been controversial. But why in the last 10 years, 15 years, has being controversial been a bad thing? That's happened fairly recently. There's a disconnect between supply and demand with editorial cartoons. What we want to supply is not what they demand. It's okay. frustrating. It goes along with my theory that right-wing media has screwed up everything. That's what they do. Pat, this is a great cartoon. Sign of the Times. You got the immigration people running sign and the Trump 2020 mega people chasing them with signs of the Times. So I grew up in um, around San Diego, which is right next to Mexico. Back, jeez, when I was a kid. Back when I was a kid. <laughs> uh, it was even an issue back then about illegal immigration. But the thing is, the growers, the farmers, the builders, the construction people needed labor from Mexico. And so these people are coming up to work, they're coming up to get a better life. And that was it. But even back then, we had people who thought that they were the problem with America, and they're not. Immigration is not the problem. Immigration is actually one of our strengths. And I'm trying to express that in this cartoon. We do see a whole lot more anti-immigration cartoons from the few conservative cartoonists. Not a whole lot of immigration cartoons from the majority liberal cartoonists. And I don't know, perhaps that's as it should be. Is there some amount of immigrants crossing the border that is too much that makes it more of an issue for you, Pat? I don't know. Other countries have taken in, as a percent of population, a lot more refugee and immigrants because people are in distress. They need help. I mean, Mexican immigrants, people from Central and South America, and these people are being threatened by gangs. Their life is just miserable because the governments don't work. Is there any limit to the amount of immigration? We're a big country. We can handle a lot. If we just changed our point of view, we could do this. And these people would be citizens. They'd be voting Republican in the next 20 years if everything worked as it should. So you think there may be a limit, to it's too much, but we're so far from it, it shouldn't be a consideration now. No, we, we've always thought it's been too much. Always, always. Back in the 1900s, back in the 1800s, they were passing these anti-immigration laws. And this is not new, but America is, a, is the greatest country in the world, mostly because of immigrants. Well, I'm an immigrant. I'm a like, 10th generation immigrant, but I was not born here. I did not come from here. My people came from a different place, but they came over here and we established ourselves and we pushed out the people that were here originally. And this is a story that should be told, that should be understood. America is not a Christian nation. America is a place that's been around for a billion years and we should respect other people's ideas. Well, they, they could solve that immigration issue, but it's too juicy a political topic. It's too, it's too effective to use politically. And honestly, if Trump is reelected, re that issue will probably be one of the main reasons. That's true. And the thing is, Republicans could have solved this immigration issue 20 years ago. There was a bipartisan bill coming out of the Senate that would have established new immigration laws. And Republicans didn't want to do it. And so the House sunk it. Even though it had bipartisan participation in the Senate, the Republican House sunk it because they don't want a solution. They don't want to solve this problem. They want to constantly bring it up. Well, opposition to immigration is driving uh, all kinds of election results in Europe. It's the reason for Brexit. It's really got legs. No, I agree. I agree. So sometimes you got to flush like 10 or 15 times. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sometimes you got to flush like 10 or 15 times as, as Trump tries to flush golden America down his golden toilet.
<laughs> That's hilarious. I think Golden Toilet is hilarious. Here you've got Trump Miley Cyrus swinging in on a wrecking ball of new EPA rules about to crash into the the Christmas ornament earth <laughs> wrecking ball. That's that's just hilarious. That's that's so many metaphors all in one. And yet and yet it is a Christmas cartoon, and editors love the Christmas cartoons. I mean, the way to get your cartoon printed is to do a Christmas cartoon. And so this is like a master course in editorial cartooning, Pat. Well, thank you. We all understand here that uh, uh, global warming is an issue, right? The world is burning down. I mean, if you're looking at what's going on in South America and Australia, and it's just the beginning of spring down there, and already they've got these massive firestorms going on. And yet, Republicans up here are saying, I mean, Utah legislature, they all say that global warming is a hoax. Uh, no, but thank you for the compliment. I love this cartoon. It's very simple, very clear, but also incredibly creative. I, I look at this and I say, why didn't I think of this cartoon? And the answer is I never would have. It's amazing. Oh, thank you. And uh, here's another movie reference cartoon with the Christmas story and the elephant with its tongue stuck to the flagpole Trump 2020. And uh, that is just uh, really apt. They are seriously suffering from this. And this is very funny. And uh, again, a Christmas cartoon, which means everybody prints it. Okay, good to know. The quibble I have is that I think the elephant would be happy. <laughs> <laughs> happy because he's always stuck to Trump. Yeah. All right, here's a giant corruption Trump uh, statue of the Black Lives Matter dad and his little daughter. He says, also known as Only My Life Matters Monument. The Corruption Monument. And here in front of your face, in front of everybody, you've got a corrupt president with his corrupt children making corrupt deals with all the nations in the world, and they're getting billions of dollars. I mean, we could talk about Jared Kushner, but this is these people are crooks. They're just absolute crooks. And so the Republican playbook is, they call us crooks, we'll call them crooks. And as far as their base goes, it works. Have you ever drawn a Hunter Biden cartoon? I did. We'll have to look it up. I can't remember. Kind of like what I just said, is that they're so focused on this one non-issue. And Hunter Biden was not a government employee, was not a government official. And the Republicans can't buy anything that he did to his father, as far as his father making any money off of it. There are remarkably few Hunter Biden cartoons by our conservative cartoonists. It's really hard to care about it. I feel a little bit sorry for the guy because he's a drug addict and a jerk. But you know that doesn't motivate me to draw a cartoon about him. He's just uh, doesn't make much of an impact in cartoons. Oh, again, good, good to know. Um, it's a non-issue, and Republicans are really good at pulling up non-issues. Uh, Benghazi, uh, I don't know, half a dozen inquiries. They spent fifty million dollars investigating Benghazi, and they got nothing. That's what they do. It's the appearance of corruption that they're looking for. It's the appearance of incompetence that they're looking for. So Trump could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and his followers would still vote for him. Here he's got the guns. He shot somebody on Fifth Avenue who wrote Trump did it in his blood on the sidewalk. His uh, no editor will print this blood. And... Uh, and the Trumpy uh, guy is saying to the policeman, why aren't you investigating Joe Biden? As everyone points at the culprit Trump. That's a wonderful cartoon. I wish it got printed. But people didn't pick it up. It was not popular. Well, I think it's just the blood. Oh, okay. What you gonna do? Yeah, what you gonna do? People really like it on social media. This is an extra bloody one. That it's all the bad guys in the world with Trump singing "We Are the World" as all of the press is bloodying and, and murdered on the ground with lots of blood. But you know, this is a cartoon Darryl, that editors don't publish because there's blood. And isn't that the really true difference between print and the social media and the internet? Is that yes, you know, in the world of you know a, a much more old-fashioned no but the place where we're going is when we're blood and everything else can be out there in the middle of the discussion. It certainly is different stuff that gets popular on the web than gets printed in newspapers. Um, well, I think that's a more accurate gauge of how good the cartoon is. You know, if, if, you're, if your gauge is how many spineless editors are going to print a cartoon versus online how many people spontaneously like and share a piece i'll, I'll go with the online folks 
No, no, this is worth a whole new, uh, a different podcast. Well, you know, our clients are newspapers, and it's newspapers who define us as editorial cartoonists, and we've never found a good market on the internet, and there's no culture for paying for our content on the internet. So we are living with newspapers, and newspapers have a largely elderly audience that has grown to love newspapers and wants to keep the experience as other news outlets have become become more popular. A couple of interesting things. Uh, you know, we, we look at the demographics of our Kegel.com site, and it is males over 65. And we look at the demographic of the people who watch our podcast on YouTube, and it is males over 65. So it's not only newspapers that are doing this, it's also the people who appreciate our art form tend to be the people that are also the audience for newspapers. And it may be that the editors are not wrong in what they edit for their taste of their audience. Um, I, I, I really hesitate to agree with that. It seems like, you know, yes, the editors have gotten more squeamish about that sort of thing. But you look at the, you know, the great cartoonists before us, Herblock or Oliphant or Malden or Conrad, there was no shortage of blood in their cartoons. Mm -hmm. I also think what's interesting, Daryl, you, what you said just seemed to make so much sense, particularly editors in a business trying to do what their you know, customers want. One of the curious things I discovered is that whenever I'm showing cartoons to the under 20s who, who didn't grow up with cartoons, they're not reading newspapers, they love cartoons, but they're seeing them on the internet where it's hard, as you point out, to find a model uh, where it can be monetized. Uh, people will love cartoons. People continue to love cartoons, but it's trying to find a way to make people pay for them. That's going to be the challenge. I think to our credit, to the cartoonist's credit, the cartoonists draw what they want, without, really without regard to whether editors are going to want to print it. Uh, it's rare that people soften their cartoon for the editors. Uh, ed editorial cartoonists uh, do really strong stuff. Uh, this hasn't impacted what cartoonists draw. Good. <laughs> I, you know they got to eat those cartoons have got to eat no you're exactly right that it doesn't impact the what they draw but um, as you know just in the business of trying to find a way to, to monetize it is going to be the challenge in the, in the years ahead um, and I suspect that there'll always be cartoons around but they may take on different forms that work well on the internet yeah yeah so Go ahead, Pat. This is a wonderful cartoon. You got I Xi Jinping sitting with Trump, who's got his fingers stuck in a Chinese finger trap puzzle. The it's Chinese puzzle. Cartoon. There just are not enough Chinese finger trap puzzle cartoons. So it's, it's so <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, I did this cartoon, and my editors actually were worried that it was maybe um, culturally insensitive. Culturally insensitive because it's a Chinese finger trap puzzle. I guess that was that was the worry. They actually had a discussion whether we should run this or not. Um, but I forgot I did this. That's a good cartoon. <laughs> that's a great cartoon. <laughs> you can look at your own cartoon and go, that's pretty good. That's that's, 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 that's what you want. <laughs> This was uh, Trump's first major meeting with a foreign leader. Okay. And here you've got the irony. Can you believe Hunter Biden using his dad to get ahead as Trump's kids are all vultures chewing the flesh off the corpse of irony? Uh <laughs> <laughs> corpse of irony is just funny. You know, irony has lost all its meaning now. Uh, yeah. We used to think irony was important. It used to be one of the things cartoonists relied on, but uh, it's just so pervasive in the world, it's hardly distinctive. They say irony is dead. I guess it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And isn't that ironic? <laughs> yeah, this is funny. The Donald Trump presidential lie Barry, what do you mean there's not a non-fiction section? This is funny. The library is a giant casino is funny. I could ask you guys, is Trump going to have a library? Is he actually going to have a presidential library? Trump and library don't really go together. I, I wonder if he, when he was last in a library. That's such an oxymoron, a Trump library. So here we've got Trump's lies as some giant snot monster. Welcome to the awards who exposed the disgusting fake news media. Uh, this, I guess, was when Trump didn't want to go to the big press gala. Well, he didn't, he didn't do the usual presidential stuff. 
culture, you got to meet the public, and you got to promote culture and you gotta promote literature and all that. We just and also excellent, excellent body fluids. I just have to command. <laughs> yes, I like the body fluid. I think snot is more acceptable than blood. Okay, so we just had this last week from military advisors that he didn't want to be bothered with our, our, our soldiers, our military. He didn't want people who'd been who'd lost limbs in war to be around because it was just too gross for him. Again, one of those things that actually he said he did. I guess the the issue I'd have with this cartoon is that he probably wouldn't be watching it on TV. You got me there. And I thought this was just a, a wonderful, beautiful looking cartoon. The the elephant with the Trump floaty as the giant waves of scandals is about to crash on him. The composition of this is funny. The little guy in the corner, the big waves with all of the waves pointing at the, the elephant, the scandal waves. I look at this and it's pretty and it's a lovely composition and all the waves pointing at him is just a wonderful device. And I love this cartoon. Well, thank you. And I grew up in California, so I know waves. Well, the idea is so simple, yet you, you send across really uh, complex and powerful messages. It's fantastic. Pat has been removed from the building. <laughs> okay, so uh, Cal, the press briefing we all crave, as Dr. Fauci says, for the safety of our citizens, I'm recommending a complete lockdown and quarantine. You've got Trump's brain in a box, quarantined. That would be excellent. Yes, indeed. It was, these things were comical in their own way, but I was just trying to find a way to capture it in an amusing fashion. Pat, just, welcome back. Okay, I've just got a few minutes here because the phone really is about to go and I've got headlights. Okay, <laughs> we're going to zip through Cal's cartoons. Cal, just tell us yep. something about each of these as they come up. Uh, here okay. we go. Stop the Madness. Cheney and the big row of Republicans all following Trump's big lie. That's great. You'll find that there's so many trying to find new ways to say that the Republicans are blindly following an idiot. Yeah. All yeah. these Trump critics are alike, as they say. Um, I've got to say, though, uh, I do whatever I can to avoid drawing crowd scenes. And you seem to love the crowd scenes. Oh, yeah, he's good at that. Well, uh, yeah, that's right. You know, I just don't have enough time in my life to do it. So it means that sleep gets good. I mean, I have sleep amounts when I have very complicated cartoons. <laughs> Uh, you know, people email me, uh, they've got a great idea for the cartoon, and uh, they want me to draw their idea. And very often, typically, it is, there's an army on the left, and it's facing off against yeah. an army on the right, and the sky is filled with helicopters. It's as though they have no respect for my laziness. <laughs> a simple image is really nice in a cartoon when it's just, you know, just a few elements, and the simplicity is really beautiful. But sometimes a cartoon is epic. And a cartoon on this scale, I love these kind of things. Oh, yeah. There's so many yeah, details to look at, and you just take in the whole scope. Yeah, you know, and, you, and the complexity of it is made simple by it being a line. Exactly. Yeah, no, wonderful. Here you've got uh, Trump with the world ready to explode with all the dynamite. Trump says, if I lose the election, I would definitely consider a transfer of power. <laughs> That's now, such a great trip, by the way. I, um, I'm proud of this cartoon because I actually did this the September before the election. And, uh, you know, then we find five weeks, five months later, this is exactly what he tried to do. Yeah. Is this watercolor? Uh, this could have been watercolor. It probably is watercolor. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, you were talking earlier about watercolor versus digital. But, uh, Cal, you can do things with watercolor no one else can. Oh, yeah, this looks like real watercolor and not digital. Mm, yeah, I, I do a little bit of both. So here you've got uh, Trump in his straight jacket being carried away by the cops. He's yelling, treacherous tra traitors, I am mentally fit for office. I demand to speak to my lawyer. And then they're dragging <laughs> Rudy Giuliani along in his straight jacket. Come in, boss. This is, uh, yeah, yeah. This is great. Yes. Um, all I can say is, is that, you know, this is a, something that happens in my dreams is, is to see these guys in, in straight jackets. But uh, maybe that day will come. <laughs> Another thing editors don't print is vertical format cartoons. But, you know, uh, sometimes you just got to do it. With some, this could have been spun around to be horizontal as well. So here you've got the two-headed beast, uh, elephant, and hippo, and Trump's on top. It says, Republicans used to be a party of truth and honor, but now they follow me. So I have designed a new party symbol that better reflects today's Republicans. Not elephants. Hippocrit. That's yeah. very nice. Well, this it is a, you I a, took out this 
This is Steve Sackian. You know, this is the only reason why I did this because Steve inspired me with his crazy creatures. Yeah. yeah. That's a fun thing to paint. And again, it looks like a real watercolor. It is, yeah. Right. Yes, that, that was. Yeah. You frame it and put it on the wall. Here's another nice real watercolor. You see the, the bright sunset and Trump says, the sun is not sitting on me. Those cheating Democrats are raising the horizon. That's great. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, I was actually, I was playing around with sunsets and, and then when I was in the middle of doing it, I said, ooh, there's a cartoon in here somewhere. So <laughs> that's kind of how it yeah. I've done that too. When I made images that were just fun to draw and then you have to find a political situation to use it. <laughs> Yep. Yep. So here's Trump at his coronation combo hanging of democracy as all the MAGA guys are fawning over him and paying attention to him, even as they are destroying democracy. That's really very nice. Well, you, what I love about this one, Daryl, is that we've talked before about the red ties being iconic for him. And uh -huh. we find different ways to use it. And this one, the red tie trail is like a ribbon and then the payoff is that you see that it's a noose for to go around uh, democracy. That's how I should have described the cartoon, because this is all about using the tie as a prop, tying him to the hanging of democracy. And uh, that's the point of it. And that's a lovely device. Thank you. And it's also another example of Republicans, you know, falling for this guy. Here you've got uh, the Republican elephant looking at Trump as he's threatening to slit the throat of democracy. Uh, Republican says he was just minding his own business on January 6th when suddenly this passerby violently attacks his knife with her neck. Some cartoons are sight gags. Some of them are word gags. And if you can mix the two, that often is can be but quite fun. And, and this one is, I'd say, mostly a word gag. It could have been even more simply drawn, but um, it's... And also, you avoided having any blood, which makes people willing to print it. Yes, and no snot as well. No snot. No bodily fluids whatsoever. So here you got the Republican MAGA police with the, holding the postal service lady who says, but we're just delivering postal ballots to the people. And Trump says, oh, yeah, with this treatment, this magnifying glass, I see a huge fraud. Pence says, that's your hand mirror, sir. This is, yeah. uh, this is just a cute everybody acting in character cartoon. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it was right. It was before the election when the postal ballots were going to be produced and the Republicans were trying to do everything they can to stop it because they felt that that would work against them. And so they're making yeah. stuff up. And this is Trump making stuff up here. Surprise. Well, uh, Trump's hair here is perfect. It's just... <laughs> It is. A wonderful thing about comic strips is so much of the humor in comic strips is just the character acting like you know the character's going to act, and then it's gratifying to see them do what you thought they would do because that reinforces what you thought. And, uh, you know, there's just, there's very few characters in editorial cartoons that we can do that with, but, you know, Trump and Pence and MAGA police and everybody just acting like they should act. It just makes for a very gratifying personality cartoon. Okay, guys... I'm down to 1%, so, and I've got a cartoon to do. So, <laughs> okay. We'll see you later, Pat. Thank you for joining us. Okay. Loved it. Bye, Pat. Good. Okay. Here you've got all of the MAGA guys with the blood and soil, white power, Nazi sign, doing their Heil Hitler salute to Fuhrer Trump, who says, trust me, there's just so many good people here just trying to hail a taxi. Uh, yeah, and that was during the Charlottesville event that took place, you know, early in his presidency, within a year, I believe. And it was a shocking thing to see. And he was being ambiguous enough to be able to lend credence to the protesters there. And so I just felt I had to find a way to say without putting Ku Klux Klan things on their head, Daryl. So I swastika in there. My apologies. But you don't worry about that. When you're doing a cartoon for The Economist, it just runs yes. in The Economist, right? Um, yeah, that's true. Okay. Uh, here you've got uh, Snake Trump. He has swallowed the elephant, uh, swallowing like a pig through a snake. And the media is saying... One year after the January 6th insurrection, how would you describe the Republican Party? And Trump the snake says, delicious. He certainly did swallow them whole, and January 6th only seemed to help that. Yeah, that's, it seems to be a common theme because it is a common theme for his presidency. You'll see that a lot in cartoons. Uh, and this cartoon, I particularly like it because I like drawing animals like Steve, and I like to combine them with people. That's kind of an old cartoonist ploy is to take real people and turn them into animals as a way of kind of demeaning them to some degree and also to make it interesting for the viewer. 
here you've got uh, Justice Department pulling down the justice statue like the Saddam statue and the impeachment police chatting with Trump saying the armed extremist who threatened you has been neutralized. The mm -hmm. justice being neutralized. That is grim but true. You notice that some of the cartoons are black and white and some are in color. The cartoons that appear in the cart in the Economist are black and white, and they can run that they could run them in color, but they're choosing choosing to have them in black and white because they like the feeling that that gives on the newspaper page. I prefer black and white too. The line work is so effective. So here you've got Mike Esper. He's tugging a mad dog Trump and holding him back with his tie leash. That's very nice. Well, he was I, a moderating uh, Esper, influence. And this is what moderation looks like with Trump. Exactly. He was talking about all the crazy things he had to stop Trump from doing. I included this cartoon in the mix because I just love the Trump feeling, you know, his kind of bulldog craziness <laughs> in this cartoon. Bulldog craziness. That's great. And here you got Trump talking to Putin. Putin says, hello, Donald. I hacked your last election, attacking your most defining national institution. I intend to do it again, only this time with more precision. And Trump says, you had me at hello. <laughs> <laughs> so, Great punchline. Uh, thank you. Well, this cartoon um, ran just after the first meeting between the two, and there was an iconic photograph of the two of them talking like this, but nobody knew what they were saying to each other. And so I project that I actually got some, you know, audio. And then this is what actually they said. And here's a very nice, uh, explain this cartoon to us. This is the death COVID swigging his COVID mace and USA the night and Trump uh, opening up his shoe. Mm. Tell us about this. Well, you guys, it's boy, it seems like ancient history, the pandemic and the craziness that went on there. But one of the things that everyone might remember is that while we were doing during lockdown and before we, we were able to have medication to be able to alleviate the worst parts of this, that Trump was agitating to open up the economy because obviously he was seeing the, the drag it was having on his popularity. But uh, everyone from scientists who knew better and, and most people uh, who, who knew the dangers of this were saying, idiocy, do not do that. So here I was doing a cartoon that was trying to say that this is what an idiotic thing to start taking off of your arm armor in the middle of a battle, essentially. And that's what he's trying to do to the U.S. And here's another dragon cartoon, finally a sane and sensible president willing to take on Kim Jong-un. That's Mitch McConnell getting burned up by Trump's dragon that he's riding on. Uh, very nice. I love dragon cartoons. Oh, I love drawing dragons. Uh, it's kind of big, you know, talk about detail. It's kind of been uh, just a, a bit of zen to start drawing a dragon and start doing all the scales it kind of occupies <laughs> me for an hour or two dragons and godzillas and monsters yeah so here's trump barricaded in the oval office with all the furniture and he said the media is a threat immigrants are a threat mueller threat democrats are a threat allies are a threat and his secretary says he says morning meeting with his inner circle the inner circle yeah. of barricaded furniture. A lovely, lots of attitude cartoon. It's one of my favorite cartoons because, first of all, what you try to do with the cartoon is save the joke for the last couple of words. So people will ha moment at the end. So it's a good combination of humorous drawing, humorous timing with the words, but then talking about something that dresses a truth. Very effective. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is the last one. We've got uh, Trump the Javelin Thrower in a multi-panel cartoon. He's running, throwing the ja javelin, bink the dra it lands on the ground, short of constitutional democracy, which is not suffering at all from his javelin throws and is looking very strong, like it is not going to suffer from anything Trump has to throw at it. So this is a nice optimistic cartoon. <laughs> Well, it was, you know, done after January 6th, where, you know, it was clear in my mind that he was actually trying to overthrow the democracy. People were trying to suggest it was all sorts of other things. And the punchline, this one is the bottom, it says he's called the overthrower, where he, in this one, he's throwing so many times and so many times he's failing. Um, it, this is what his intention is to go back and try it again. And if we let him, he, he would do it again. This would be a great animated cartoon. It would. You know, I I'll bet he never put a thought into overthrowing democracy. He was just thinking that he wanted to win and it was all about him. And any mention of democracy comes only from the left and the right doesn't recognize any of that. 
And I kind of get a little bit of that. I feel like all of this crazy election vote fighting nonsense just all grew out of Bush versus Gore. And that just made it all standard. Like, that's how you fight an election. You do all that legal nonsense at the end. And uh, he had his precedent. Well, my thought is that there is some, I think, maybe where it is a little bit different in Trump's case is that he, and what will probably be discovered more as we go along is, is that he knew that he hadn't won and that he was going to use extra legal ways to try to guarantee that he stays in office. So in the case of Bush Gore, everyone was trying to use legal ways, but now we're branching out into those extra legal ways. And that's when we get in real dangerous waters. Well, I, I agree with you, Daryl, that it seems like it's all about getting the most votes for your side, no matter what. And the whole idea of trying to restrict voting or to make it harder for people to vote. That's all based on trying to make your side win and the other side lose. And it's not so much we want to destroy democracy as we want to win no matter what the cost is. Well, on that note, that was our last cartoon, gentlemen, and thank you for being with us. I really appreciate it. It's wonderful to get you to finally do this, Steve, and wonderful to have (laughs) our first outside cartoonist for the first time, Cal. And Steve, I hope you'll come back because you have a vast archive on evergreen topics that we could do more podcasts on, and I will twist your arm. Yeah, why didn't you use my best cartoons? I love all your stuff, Steve, and I'm just, uh, I'm a big fan, and I'm Oh, thank you, Daryl. And I'm honored to be on the same podcast with Cal and Pat. um, Yes. Among my favorite cartoonists, too. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, it was a it's a great combination. And poor Daryl is now going to spend 12 hours editing this. <laughs> uh, anybody watching this is not going to know how much I edit out. And that is, uh, I guess, a, a hidden blessing. So thank you so much. And remember to subscribe to the Cast wherever you're watching or listening today. And uh, Kegelcast is available in both video and audio f- versions. So if you don't see the cartoons, go to Kegel.com or Apple Podcasts or YouTube or Spotify to see the video podcast. Uh, One way I like to see it is on the Podcruncher app because it really is better in video, but if you only get audio, it is still the best podcast around. And gentlemen, thank you for being here. I really enjoyed it and I hope to have you guys back again. This was fun. It was crazy and an editing challenge, but it was fun. It was fun. It was. Bye guys. Great stuff. All right. See you later.